Situated off the west coast of Scotland, the Inner Hebridean Isle of Mull offers outstanding wildlife and unspoilt wilderness experiences. Many of the species that live here have been resident since the last ice age. And so, using nature as our guide, we shall piece together a story of how the land itself shaped cultural revolutions from hunter-gatherer to Bronze Age cosmology on Mull. We begin at the head of Loch Bui and the only stone circle on Mull. Similarities to circles on the mainland have enabled archaeologists to date this ring of nine granite stones to between the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. Although diminutive in comparison with the iconic megaliths of Orkney, this stone circle undoubtedly played a significant role in rituals on Mull. The alignment of nearby monoliths to celestial events also speaks of a highly developed culture of cosmology. If I stand at the centre of the circle and turn towards the tall outlying stone, its location gives the position of the setting sun at the winter solstice. Of course, four and a half thousand years ago, the line of trees behind would not be obscuring the view. Also to the southwest, is another outlier, which gives the declination of the sun at the winter quarter days of early November and February. In the adjacent field is a standing stone, which gives another possible astronomical function. Projecting a line from the stone to the shoulder of Bien Goth indicates a point close to the rising position of the sun at the two summer quarter days. Cosmological alignments such as these are found in structures the length of Britain, showing that sophisticated concepts were readily carried in the minds of people at that time. The transition from Neolithic to Bronze Age should actually be thought of as a development or refinement of the cultural and spiritual ideas which originally gave rise to the stone megaliths. To begin with, it was cast copper which first entered circulation. The problem with copper is that it is soft and malleable, a material inferior to flint and stone as a cutting edge. Therefore, until it was alloyed with tin to make bronze, copper must have been predominantly for decorative or ritual adornment, which conferred importance and status to the wearer. The arrival of copper and cosmology also brought about a change in funerary practice, from communal passage graves to individual burials. Within sight of the Loch Bewey stone circle are the remains of a curb cairn. We can still see the false portal entrance and a curb of boulders. Pottery beakers, jewellery and copper ceremonial axe heads may have been laid alongside the body. Large pebbles would have then been used to backfill the grave. These could have been brought up from the nearby beach, but other inhumations of this type are known to have been filled with marble sourced from locations remote from the grave site. A solitary burial of an undoubtedly important person, surrounded by a gleaming disc of white marble so that all could remember. Could there be a lunar significance in the new age of cosmology? The departed still shining through the eternal darkness like the moon at night. But before the Neolithic and Bronze Age farmers, this land had been inhabited by nomadic hunter-gatherers who left their own subtle signature to mark their passing. We cannot overlook the fact that this cairn is surrounded by a circle of beech trees. Of course, these particular trees were not alive in the Mesolithic. But if others were on this site 6,000 years ago, bearing edible fruits in the autumn, this would certainly have been regarded as a very important place. 
On other sites, henges of wood were constructed before being superseded by stone. In all probability, these places were likely to have been of special significance long before the Neolithic. Hunters and gatherers would have found many other aspects of the environment here at Loch Bewey well suited to their needs. Herds of red deer roamed the hills during the summer months, descending to lower ground for the autumn rut and to overwinter on sheltered grazing. Arctic hare and ptarmigan are also likely to have been sought out. Seal and otter could have been hunted at the water's edge, with seaweed and shellfish offering foraging opportunities. Seabirds and migratory geese presented a variation in diet. Trout and salmon swimming up river to spawn could be speared or trapped with comparative ease. The inland lochs, rivers and multitude of mountain springs provided fresh water that never ran dry in the maritime Atlantic climate. Forests of seemingly inexhaustible birch and pine gave timber for fire, along with all the fruits and medicinal plants that thrive in the undergrowth. Above the North Shore are caves, which almost certainly would have been used by the Mesolithic population. At the opposite end of the beach, below basalt scarified by the effects of glaciation, lies an outcrop where stones can easily be cleaved away from the layered parent rock. Before making this film, I had never visited Loch Bewey, nor had I fully appreciated the complexities of Mull's geology. During a morning stroll with Rafa, when my eyes fell upon some rough shaped stones, and I immediately recalled the Stone Age axe factory, situated on the high slopes of the Langdales in Cumbria. Surely the potential of these stones to be further shaped was not lost to the thoughts of the hunter gatherers on Mull either. In common with many other Stone Age sites, Loch Bewey is at the centre of a natural amphitheatre, as if nature's spiritual energy is gathered and concentrated within it. But while the Bronze Age was a logical extension of new Stone Age thinking, the arrival of the Neolithic in the world of the hunter-gatherer was something completely different altogether. The two ways of life were simply incompatible. Ultimately, the early farmers' motivations swept aside the hunters, felling the forests, tilling the land, and forcing the creatures of the wild wood to flee. It is not unreasonable to imagine a forlorn attempt at resistance by the hunter-gatherers akin to the Native American Indian's plight in the face of the European invaders. In other places, maybe on the remote fringes of Neolithic influence, 
first contact with the hunters was possibly more peaceable and the transition gradual. But whether it took one generation or 50, the end result was the same and could never be undone. The culture of the Neolithic brought new demands. The people needed a place to meet, a place to exchange items, a place to share ideas, and a place for their spiritual fulfillment. The stone circle and megalith cosmologies took over from the wild nature as the focus for all these things. It was the beginning of mankind's delusion that he was the master of all that he surveyed. As I look around Tobermory, the island's main town, I think our own motivations are not so different from our Neolithic ancestors. But if we really want to understand nature, we must once again learn to think like the original hunter-gatherers.